Church. Woo! It's good to be in the house of God this morning. Amen. North Carolina style. I feel like I ought to have like some barbecue in my hand to pass out this morning or something. Um, wow. How about the presence of God this morning? How about the presence of God? Can we just give him another offering of praise this morning? Thank you, Jesus, Lord, just for being in this place today, Lord. We just love you so much. I am so excited to uh, be with you this morning, to just go into the word with you this morning, to see what God has for us. Um, just so blessed. I uh, just feel so blessed. And like Pastor Michael was saying this morning, just so thankful. Um, and I want to give honor to uh, Pastor Michael and Pastor Erica this morning. We just love them so much. And um, let's give them some honor this morning. We have amazing pastors. And if there's one thing I know about them, they're following the heart of God. Amen. And that's what matters. So do you have the word of God with you this morning? Yeah. All right, because I'm ready to go. Um, I want us to turn to Mark chapter 13. If you have the word of God with you, go with me there. And let's dive into the word this morning and see what God has for us. So Mark chapter 13, and I'm going to start reading at verse 3. And the word says, And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations. Let's pray this morning, church. Father, we come before you this morning, God, knowing that we are nothing without you, God. We are just vessels of clay, Lord. And Father, we thank you, God, that you have given us your word today, God. And I pray, God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit today, God, that you would reveal to us, God, that you would illuminate, Lord, our paths today, God, as we dive into your word. We pray, God, that it be the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that does a changing work within us this morning, God. And to you, Lord, be all the glory, Lord. I pray, God, that every word that I speak, Lord, this morning would be yours and not mine for your glory and not my own, Jesus. And I leave it to you. God to do the work. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So as this passage opens this morning in Mark chapter 13, Jesus and his disciples have just come out of the temple. And the disciples are just in awe. You know, they're looking at the temple and they're like, Jesus, check this out. Like, can you believe the magnitude of this? You know, and I used to have this saying, it's funny that Pastor Michael talked about me being from North Carolina. There's been times when I've been in big cities and I've been like, Ellie Mae comes to town. I mean, some of y'all know the Clampets, right? And I would just be in such awe. So that's the kind of moment that they're having here at the beginning of this chapter. And Jesus looks at them and he says, oh, these columns, these pillars, yeah, there won't even be one standing against the other. And then something really cool takes place, church. The Word of God tells us that they go outside of the temple and they sit opposite the temple. And then it's just Jesus and Peter and James and John and Andrew. Give us some power, Jesus. <laughs> and as they're sitting there, it's so amazing to me because this is a private moment that the disciples get to have with Jesus. They're away from the crowds. They're not in the temple anymore. Jesus pulls them aside and he sits with them. And then he begins to reveal more things to him. You know, how many of us know this morning that when we set aside, amen, when we set aside ourselves to spend time with Jesus, that he speaks to us. Come on, church. You're not going to go to sleep on me this morning. 
how many of us know that when we get along with him, he's going to speak and he's going to reveal things to us that he may not tell us when we're in the crowd. See, I love hearing him in the house of God. Like it was so, that's a spot right there. Like it was so sweet right there this morning. But I'm going to tell you what I love when I'm in my prayer closet and none of y'all are around and it's me and Jesus. Because we can have church in the prayer closet like we can have church in here. Amen. And so God tells us in his word, he shows us how he takes them away privately and he begins to speak to them. You know, when you're in that private place with God, you can ask him your questions. Come on, somebody. You can ask him your questions, all those things that you're pondering and wondering and you don't understand. And so they begin to ask him, Jesus, when? When is all this going to happen? You know, when is this destruction going to come to Jerusalem? Wasn't this like reading the headlines this morning? It, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's like reading the headlines. But Jesus was telling them about the destruction that was coming to Jerusalem and to the temple. And they want to know when, and they want signs. And Jesus tells them, there's some things that even I don't know. But then he says, but let me tell you what I do know. And I tell you what, I want to know everything that God wants to tell me. Amen. And I want you to know it too. And so he begins to reveal things to him. And I love how God is so intentional about what he reveals to us and what he doesn't reveal to us. And I know there's been times in your life when you had to trust him, when you didn't know, when the answer didn't come right away. But he had a purpose in that too. And so he begins to reveal things to them. He begins to say to them, there's some signs that I want you to be watching for. I'm not going to tell you the exact time, but I want you to be watching. And so this reminds me so much, you know, being a, being a country girl, and I know y'all can't tell by my accent, like one of my sweetest memories with my family was going on road trips. Anybody, like, love a road trip with the family, right? And I know this is going to be shocking for our younger generation. We used to take trips without GPS. <gasps> I know, right? There was no GPS back in those days. And so we would head out on these trips, you know, and they'd be like 14-hour trips to Florida. And I, I know there had to be 100,000 times that my brother and I asked the question, Woo, y'all got it! Yeah, there's even a movie named that, right? And I mean, and it shows you, if you're not a parent, you learn the patience of God when you get to be a parent, and you learn that your parents were very patient with you. And we would ask them, like, are we there yet? Like, we got to be closer. Are we there yet? And see, back in those days without GPS, we didn't have an ETA. Come on. We didn't know the exact minute we were going to pull into the driveway. We didn't know the road obstacles that might be ahead. We didn't know if there was a traffic jam. We just knew that there were signs. Come on, church. We knew that there were signs that we were to watch. And with every sign that we passed, we knew that we were getting closer to our destination. And I'm here to tell us this morning, church, we are getting closer with every day that passes to our final destination. And God has a word for us this morning. He wants us to be watching for the signs. Amen. Amen. And then he goes on to tell them, I've given you the signs. He's given us the map. Amen. He's given us the map, but he's not going to shove this map in our face. You've got to get up every morning. You've got to put this map in front of your eyes and you've got to receive the word into your soul. We have the map and we have the signs. And one thing is for sure. Like I said earlier, when you look at the headlines, when you look at what is going on with the world, you know we're getting closer. Amen. Amen. Now, we couldn't even begin to scratch the surface this morning. If we tried to go into end times and we tried to go into prophecy, Pastor Michael, you know there's no way. We'd be here till next Sunday and we still wouldn't have a, a, even three pages covered. That's not my assignment this morning. My assignment this morning is for us to be aware of our posture and our stance in these days that we're living in. He goes on to give them instructions, and I believe that these are instructions for us this morning, church. The very first thing that he says to them as he's revealing the signs, he says, don't be alarmed. Don't be troubled. He says, don't be troubled. That's not your stance. See, we're not called to be alarmed. We're not called to panic. There may be trouble all around us in the world, but we are not to be troubled. Amen? In John 16, the Word of God says, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. 
take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, I can't tell you everything that we're going to face. I don't know. And I'm not even going there pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. But I know one thing he's telling us, that we're to have peace. And the next thing that he's telling us is that we are to take heart. We're to be courageous. I mean, if there's ever been a time to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get on with the work of God, we're living in that day. Be courageous. And to rest in knowing that he has overcome the world. Amen. Amen. See, he gives us these instructions because he wants us to be secure in our stance and in our posture. I remember when everything first started with COVID-19, I just kept hearing the Lord say, keep your stance. Keep your stance. Keep your stance. Three words. Keep your stance. And you know what I did? I dug in my heels, Pastor Michael, and I said, okay, God, I don't know what 2020 looks like anymore, but I'm going to keep my stance. And I'm going to keep my stance by staying in the Word of God. Amen, church? And the next thing that he tells them after he says, don't be alarmed, he says, be on your guard. Be on your guard. If you look at chapter 13, and I hope you'll go home today and read the whole chapter because it is so good. He tells them three different times, be on your guard. Be on your guard. I love hearing the voice of God. I love spending time with God. I love journaling what God says. And it excites me when I hear him say something one time. But if God is taking his time to tell me something three times, I don't want to miss it. Amen? We don't want to miss this. So I did a little bit of digging, and Pastor Michael knows I love to research words. I love to go back to the original Greek and Hebrew, and I will have myself a time. I want us to understand exactly what God was saying to us when he said, be on your guard. The per- first part of this definition would be to have sight, to see. That's pretty understandable, right? To have sight, to see. We better pay attention in the day that we're living in. I'm going to say that again. We better pay attention in the day that we're living in to what we see. We better have spiritual vision in the day that we're living in church. Matthew 6, says it this way. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. That's pretty deep. I went to the Passion Translation. Listen to this. And it says, The eyes of your spirit allow revelation light. Do you know what revelation light is? Right here. Teachings of Jesus. Teachings of Jesus. So, revelation light comes from the eyes of my spirit, and it enters into my being. And then it goes on to say, And if your heart is unclouded, the light floods in. Okay, so what does that mean, church? That means that when I pick up the Word of God, and I'm in right standing with Him, and Pastor Michael, I love something you said recently about going to prayer. You thank Him, you repent. Then you seek Him. There's a key to that, church. When I go to Him in right standing, and I let Him take a look at my heart, and then I open up the Word, I can receive it, and it will feed my spirit. Stay with me, church. It will feed my spirit. So when I'm feeding my soul, I'm nourishing my soul. Amen? But it says if my heart is unclouded. Oh, it's about to get messy right now. It says if my heart is unclouded, so how does my heart get clouded? Because I'm going to tell you, you're not reading your Bible 12 hours a day. Right? I mean, there's a whole lot going on around us right now, right? When we're turning on the news, when we're reading the headlines, when we're going to articles, when we're researching things, there's a whole lot just coming at us. But what about the things that we choose to allow to come at us? I told you it's going to get messy. What about the things that I choose to turn on and watch with my eyes? What about the things that I turn on and I choose to listen to with my ears? Oh, come on, don't get quiet. Don't get quiet. See, what about those things? I have two choices. Every time I choose something to watch, read, or listen to, I'm either going to nourish my soul or I'm going to cloud my soul. 
and I get to make the choice and you get to make the choice. And if what we watch and what we listen to isn't honoring God, then I'm going to tell you, you have no business listening to it and watching it. I'm going to tell you the rule of thumb. Yeah, go on and give him some praise. I'm going to tell you the rule of thumb at my house, and you can ask my boys this. Through the years, I've told them, if you wouldn't watch it and you wouldn't listen to it with Jesus sitting next to you, you have no business, no business letting it into your soul because that's what you're doing is you're letting it into your soul. But it's not just that simple. See, the Word says that we are to have fervent prayers, effectual and fervent prayers of the righteous, what it availeth much. It tears down things. We can tear down strongholds when our prayers are effective and they're fervent. Now, let me ask you something. How effective do you think our prayers are going to be when we are entertaining ourselves with things that are offensive to God and then we are coming into his house trying to pray that he will rid our nation of it? Come on. When I'm turning on the television, if I'm choosing to watch things that are offensive to God, and I would say 90% of television is offensive to God, you cannot turn it on without seeing adultery, fornication, deception, witchcraft, rebellion, and the list goes on and on. And if you don't think it's offensive to Him, get in the Word. So how am I going to entertain myself with that and then I'm going to get on my knees and ask God to clean up the world when all the time he wants to clean up us? See, the word says that judgment starts in the house of God. We are the ones who represent his name. I'm called to be in the world, but I am not called to be of the world. That means if you look like the world and you're talking like the world and you're acting like the world and you're going where the world is going... You ain't doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to look different. You're supposed to look different. His countenance cannot rest upon you when you don't want to look different. Yeah. But here's the cool part. When he pricks us, when he convicts us, And all it takes is a moment. All it takes is a moment. I'm going to show you how this works. 15 seconds. I want everybody in here. Close your eyes. Don't look at your neighbor. In your heart right now, I want you to ask God, is there anything that I'm watching or listening to or entertaining that is offensive to you? Speak to us, God. If there is anything that he's spoken to you right now, I'm not going to ask you what it is, but can you just raise your hand? If there's anything right now that you know that you're entertaining that you shouldn't be, raise your hand. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. All right, put your hands down and open your eyes. Now, here's the cool part. See, God doesn't reveal these things to us to condemn us. He reveals these things to us because he loves us and he wants to purify his church because there is a work for us to do in these last days and we have to have the power of the Holy Ghost working and flowing on the inside of us. So he comes to us, Pastor Michael, to reveal these things because he wants to put us in alignment. He doesn't want me to the left and he doesn't want me to the right. He wants me right here in the center of his word. Amen. And in alignment with his will. Amen. And that's what he wants for the body of Christ. Because the word says he is coming back for a bride that is holy and without blemish. That's not preached a lot these days. But that's what the word says. And I believe church there is a direct correlation between purity and pursuit of holiness and walking in the fullness of of the power of God. The fullness of the power of God. We're living in exciting times. He wants us full of the power of God. All right. Now we'll leave that between you and God. Amen. Part two of that one word. He says, not only do I want you to see, but once you see, I want you to discern. And then I want you to take heed. All of that and be on your guard. Now, what does that mean? Not only am I to see it, but this is where I need the power of the Holy Spirit to give me discernment. 
to give me discernment. If I asked you, the best example I can come up with in the Bible is Solomon. If I asked you, church, what did Solomon pray for? Wisdom. All right, let's dig. So in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9, Solomon does ask God for wisdom. But check it out, church. He asked God for so much more. He said, God, I'm asking you for an understanding mind to govern your people that I can discern between what is good and what is evil. And if you look at that word, it means to have a hearing heart, to have discernment, to separate what's good and what's evil. So it's like this. You take in something with your eyes, with your spiritual vision, and the Holy Ghost goes to work and starts to pull it apart and dissect it for you. It's a mental distinguishing that's taking place that you can't do in yourself. That has to be done by the Holy Ghost. Amen? And God's response to him is that I'm going to give you a wise and discerning mind. He said, I'm going to give you what you've asked for. And here comes not only wisdom, but here comes discernment. Why is this important to us, church? Because God was not only giving him wisdom, he was giving him the ability to take what he saw, to understand it with God's wisdom, and to distinguish between good and evil. Discernment allows you to see what is right and what is almost right. That's the best way I can explain it. What might look right, but God says, "Mm -mm. mm-mm, mm-mm. You with me, church? He'll reveal things to you you hadn't even asked him to reveal when you're praying for wisdom and discernment. You'll walk in a room and you'll see a person and God will say, "Uh uh-uh. My husband and I have had this happen. We walked out of an event one night, and I said, you know, so-and-so, never met him before. He said, "Mm mm-hmm. I said, "Mm mm-mm. Nope, something's not right with that. I said, that's Holy Ghost discernment right there. Never met the person before. And months later, "Mm mm-hmm. I said, that's what God was talking about. He will show you things you've not even asked for because you've asked for his Holy Spirit to have discernment in your life. We need the spirit of discernment working in our lives. We need the Holy Ghost at work in our lives. I cannot say it enough today. And this is why, because the Bible tells us that the devil himself will disguise himself as an angel of light. And it doesn't stop there. And then it says, and his servants will disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Headlines this week. Headlines this week. This one hit close to home. Christian college. Christian college. Servant of righteousness. But something was exposed. See, and I believe we're living in a day where God is revealing things that have been done in secret. Things of darkness that have been done that nobody's known about. And the Holy Ghost is pulling back the curtain and saying, "Uh uh-uh, it's time. Your game is up. I've got your number. And it's time that the world knows what you've been up to. It is a time that we are going to see secret things coming forth and exposed to the light of the gospel. And that's what we need to be praying for, church. That's what we need to be praying for. God, bring to full light everything that's being done in darkness. Everything. Praying for wisdom. Praying for discernment. And then God tells them something else. In the middle of all these instructions, in the middle of here's, here, here's how your stance should be, here's how your posture should be, should be, we see his heart. We see his heart. You know, and i got to tell you, the last few weeks, something I've been praying more and more for is, God, I want to know your heart. I want to see your heart. I don't want to just bring you my list of needs. I don't want to bring you my checklist of what I need for you to do for me. God, today, what is on your heart? How can I intercede because of what's on your heart today, God? And so in the midst of this, he goes, oh, wait, yeah, but first. But first, the gospel 
is going to be preached to all nations. But first, the gospel is going to be preached to all nations. See, church, I'm going to tell you something. From the very beginning, from Genesis, and all through the end to Revelation, it always has been, and it always will be, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It always be Jesus came, he died, he took my sins, he chose a cross, and he was resurrected again. Hallelujah, and he is coming back. Always been about Jesus. Always will be about Jesus. And he says to them, don't forget. Don't forget about the harvest. Don't forget about the work. When things start going out of control, when trouble is all around you, don't forget why you're here. I know we're living in a pandemic. I've never preached to people before in masks. <laughs> but you know what? Even in the midst of what's going on, God says there's a work to do right now. Pray for creative strategies. Pray for him to open your eyes to your mission field. I think so many times we think we have to jump on an airplane and I'm all about international missions. I've done them myself. But we don't have to go to other nations to minister. I guarantee you, if you ask God to show you your sphere of influence, you have co-workers, you have neighbors, you have a delivery man, you have people who are checking out your groceries at Walmart that need to hear about Jesus. One of the most eye-opening experiences I've ever had in my whole life is when Joshua started working with the youth. And this was even before the rise. We had gatherings in our home and young people would just come and we would feed them and they would hear about the word of God. And it blew me away, church. There's teenagers coming into my house that have never even heard about Jesus. Don't even have a family Bible at home. Never even heard about the gospel. It's all around us. It's all around us. And I believe God just wants to be reminding us this morning that the fields are white unto harvest. And we are the harvesters. We want to be instruments in his hands to go forth and tell people about Jesus. When everybody else is in chaos, tell them, I got this peace. I got this peace. I'd love to tell you all about it. Like it's a peace that passes all understanding because you know it is. Amen. Tell them about the Jesus that you serve. Amen. The worship team can come up if they want to and I'll try to close somewhere. Uh, but you know the, the passage goes on and I'm not reading the whole chapter today but I want to go down to verse 32 because there's a shift in this passage he's talking to his disciples he's telling them about what's going to happen in Jerusalem and we know it comes to pass and then he shifts them and he says to them but concerning that day or that hour no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven. Nor the Son. He's talking about himself. But only the Father. Be on guard. He says it again. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and he puts his servants in charge. There's some servants in charge right here this morning. Each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, he's talking to them. He says, I say to all, all of us, stay awake. Stay awake. How many times did we hear it in those five verses? Stay awake four times. Four times in five verses. Stay awake. Stay awake. And this just isn't staying awake and not being asleep. It's so much deeper than that, church. He says, I want you to watch with vigilance. I want you to watch with expectation. I want you to watch with intent. Turn right over to Mark chapter 14. 
And Jesus himself is about to face crucifixion. We find him again with three of the same disciples. Three of the same ones are with him. It's Peter, it's James and John. And he takes them into the garden of Gethsemane with him. And he says to them, can you watch? Can you watch? Can you pray? See, he knew what he was about to endure. He knew every moment of what he was about to endure. But yet even Jesus had to steal away to pray. But he says to the disciples, the same three. Here he goes again. Three more times. He comes to them. Can't you wake up? Can't you wake up? Can't you just watch and pray? And then he goes back and he prays. And then he comes back and they're asleep again. And he says, can't you just wake up? Can't you watch? Can't you pray? And again, he goes back again. And he comes back that third time. And he says the same thing to him. And then you know what, church? He's like, never mind. It's time. This is so heavy on my heart this morning, church, because we will never get this season back. Don't waste this season. We have been called to watch. We have been called to pray. And I love when I think about of all the people who could have lived upon this earth at this time, he chose us to be here. There is a mandate to pray. There is a mandate to intercede. There is a mandate to stay awake. And I don't know about you, church, but not on my watch. You might as well get on your feet. I said, not on my watch. How about it, church? Not on your watch. Are we praying over our nation? Are we praying over our children? Are we praying over our marriages? Are we praying over our co-workers? Are we praying over our government? And the list goes on and on. Are we praying for the unsaved? When is the last time we prayed for somebody who didn't know Jesus? It is not time for us to get in our bubble and be safe and secure and complacent. It is time for us to get out there and do the work that God has called us to do. Amen. Worship team, lead us this morning. Spirit of God. Fall fresh on us. We need your presence. Your kingdom come. Your will be done here as in heaven. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. scriptures here this morning word of God says in that 24th verse it says but in those days 
after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be fallen from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's us, y'all. Woo! That ought to get somebody excited this morning. And then they will see. That's us. Yeah. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. We know how this ends. Amen. We know how this ends. Amen. He's coming. Amen. And we're going. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. So I just want to encourage you, church. You know, just take this word this morning. Let it do some work in your heart. You know, I, my boys know this. My husband knows this. Anytime I seek the Lord about something, it's, it ministers to me before it ever goes anywhere else. It steps on my toes before it steps on any other ones. Such a word. He wants to remind us, though, to be alert. We're living in such a time. Let's just stay alert, church. And let's do the work we're called to do. Amen? Amen. I'm going to give it to you, Pastor Michael. God bless you, church. <laughs>